City Church. Great to be here today. I want to continue our series on the miracles of Jesus Christ, but one other thing has come to my remembrance at this moment. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, gifts and offerings in the church, when, when people uh, need help quite often, we, we can't just randomly write out checks for people. The government calls that money laundering. <laughs> and and uh, so, so I don't have the authority to just say, you know, you have a need, I'm going to write you out a check from City Church and give it to you. They want you to pay tax on that, right? So, so, so it's different with honorariums. There is, there's some systems in place for that already with the government. But Larissa has friends and family and people in the Ukraine that are going through hardship because of the circumstances that are there. And so I want to be able to, to, to put resources in her hands from time to time and, and, and the McLeods as well because they can get it to people uh, that have need. Now, we're not looking to support any military stuff or any of that kind of stuff, but we know the people are hurting. And, and, and so... So um, if you can do that and you can connect with her and you can help out in some capacity, I want you to do that. I'm going to do it on a personal level myself and uh, because uh, we have a heart for the people. And, and, uh, and we're the church and we're prospering in Canada. And so uh, if you feel it in your heart that God's been speaking to you, how you could be a blessing to someone, reach out to Larissa or Ron McLeod and uh, they, they have connections there that we don't, and they can get the money to them. They have systems in place. They know how they can get it into their bank account. They've, they're from Ukraine, so they know how that works. And so uh, it's just way smoother than us trying to write out a check and, and, and then uh, go through whatever issues we have to go through to actually make it legal. Okay, so uh, that's my heart, and... and uh, uh, so I invite you to participate in that manner as well. Well, I'm not going to read my opening line again. Today my message is titled, Jesus Goes Fishing. I don't know about you, but I love the miracle power of God. Dan, there's a clip on YouTube, and I was going to mention this to you this morning, but I still want it. Uh, it, it it's, um, it's from The Chosen. Just uh, type in YouTube, uh, miracle of Jesus filling the boat with fishes, and it'll pop up. It's probably the only one you'll see. Uh, it's, uh, but anyways, you'll see it. And uh, it's about three or four minutes, and we'll play that at some point. So you got some time ahead of you, okay? I don't know about you, but I love the miracle power of God. You love that? Yeah, yeah we're blue collar. I always say that. We can kind of go with the flow. We're not too religious around here. I love to see and hear about people who have received miracles in their lives. It doesn't matter how big or how small the miracles are. I am always excited to hear that God is manifesting himself in people's lives through signs and wonders. Isn't that exciting when, when someone has a testimony of how God intervened in their life? Whether it's a big miracle or a small miracle, um, I'm excited about it. Jesus provides the miracle catch of fish at, uh, on the lake Gennesaret for his disciples. So let's look at Luke 5, 1 through to 11. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught, taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word... I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets, their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. 
and they came and filled the boat, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he had all, or for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John and the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. This is an exciting miracle. Jesus is fishing for more than fish. He's fishing for men who will become fishers of men. It would have been exciting to be there and have seen the fish pouring into the boats to feel the adrenaline rush and the joy, excitement and the laughter in the air. I don't know if you've ever been fishing when the fish are biting in every cast is an adventure. I remember one time Gene and I went fishing in, and uh, it was Little Bobtail Lake or something and, and uh, man, as fast as you could cast in there, you would catch a trout. I think we caught 54 fish in four hours. That was back in the days when, uh, yeah, you only caught five. But uh, Lorraine and Terry were with us as well. Uh, I, I know I, my rod was ready to go, and by the time you had yours set up, I had a couple of fish already. But, uh, but it was really good. Uh, it was back in the day before things were fished out. We were little kids, and man, it, we were stoked. We were pumped, eh? We were just pulling them in, and... They never shut us down. I mean, uh, you know, we just thought this is the way you do her. Fill her up. Uh, and uh, nowadays they would probably throw the key away. Uh, but we were little kids and we were stoked. Uh, you know, every cast was an adventure. It, it, it is what every fisherman lives for. And then someone lands a big one and excitement and laughter fills the air. Hope is high and adrenaline is flowing. Can you imagine what Simon, James, and John must have experienced along with the other fishermen who helped them fill both of these boats? Incredible. In fact, it was to the point where Peter falls down on his knees and says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. This was an amazing miracle of God. Dan, do you got the clip? Okay, let's watch it. Could you turn the lights out, Kiaya, behind you? A little bit farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night.
I told you. I told you. I told you. My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. You as well. Yes, you, James and John. Come, follow me. I'll take the fish to the market and settle up Simon's death. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> You've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> Go! Now! Hey, it's Dallas and the creator of The Chosen, and yes, Thanks, season Dad. one of The Chosen is complete. All eight episodes. Heather, could I get you those lights? Kiaya, could you put those lights on, please? Well, it's not quite how it happened. Never really is. But I enjoyed that clip from the cho Chosen. Uh, I get emotional when I see stuff like that. Uh, of course, there was two boats they filled, and, uh, and they launched out into the deep. But uh, it costs more to do that when you're making a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, nevertheless, it gives us some idea of what kind of miracle it was. It is always exciting to see miracles take place. I'm sure many believing fishermen could testify how Jesus filled their boats to this very day. The supernatural manifestation of the power of God is often broken into two categories, miracles and providence of God. They are both supernatural and miraculous in their own way. They do differ in how God chooses to manifest his power and through what means. How they are, are di differ uh, from one another are sometimes obvious and sometimes not so obvious. How is a miracle different from the providence of God? It's important to know the difference between the providence of God and a miracle. A miracle is God working outside his creation laws. Providence is God working through his creation laws. Let me give you some obvious examples of God's providence at work through our prayers. If you're out of work and you pray for a job, your phone rings and someone asks you if you would like a job, that is considered the providence of God. It's still supernatural, but God is working through his creation laws, through people in this example. On the other hand, if you're blind, lame, or deaf, and we pray for you and you receive your sight or you take up your bed and walk, or you receive your hearing, that is considered a miracle because God is working outside of his creation uh, laws. So, so having said this, 
I personally call everything that God does in my life that is super, a supernatural manifestation of the power of God a miracle. I do not get hung up on these terms. They are both the supernatural power of God to fulfill his promises in our lives. And I think that's important. Uh, for example, if you Google the miracle of Jesus filling the boats with fish, you will find two different accounts of these miracles taking place. Luke 5 and John 21, where we see the exact miracle happen a second time. However, they would fall under the provision of God or the providence of God because Jesus was working through creation laws. The fish were in the ocean and the men were in the boats, right? He didn't have to create the fish, although he may have. I don't know. We don't know. They, they were in the water, you know. Yet 99% of Christians and the resources refer to those events as miracles. And I'm good with that. I'm just fine with it. God's provision, or sorry, sorry God's providence is, defined, is uh, defined, is the working of his power to uphold, guide, and care for his creation. And this is where it gets kind of um, murky believers and unbelievers alike. So God's providence is there for believers and unbelievers alike, right? I have a problem with this when it comes to supernatural provision. The so, so I call the providence of God miraculous when faith is exercised or required and providence is made. To me, that's a miracle. And, and I'm just saying, to me, that's a miracle. Everyone gets the providence of God. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, the scripture states. That's the providence of God. He provides for his creation. <coughs> uh, those who believe receive supernatural providence of God. So I call that a miracle. And I think most of Christianity does whether they are technically right or technically wrong. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I could draw up an example quickly in my head. If you're a single mother and, and, and your car is broke down and, and, and you're out of food and you're going to get kicked out of your home because your rent is due and, and, and a mechanic shows up at your house, fixes your car, say Dan shows up, fixes your car, pays your rent, and leaves you with a couple of bags of food and says, God sent me. That's the providence of God. But it's a huge miracle to that woman. She doesn't want to hear it's the providence of God. She goes, that's a miracle in my life. I'm, I'm at the 11th hour, and I don't know what to do. I'm coming unglued. And to her and her heart, that's the best miracle she's received maybe in her life. And so, so I don't say that to be negative or debate anything or anything along them lines. Uh, I just don't get hung up on, on whether God chooses to work within his creation laws or outside of his creation law, uh, laws. It's totally irrelevant to 99% of those looking for God's help in their time of need. And they just say it's mir miraculous, you know. Well, if, if, if you're going about your day and God interferes with your day and he spins you around and points you my direction to be a miracle in my life uh, or, or to bring his provision into my life, it's still miraculous that God spun your day around and interrupted you. But it is the providence of God. It's the way God provides through his people and through his body. And so it's both. Uh, the main point is just the just shall live by faith. That's the main point. We, we believe God for miracles and the power of God is manifest to those in, in those who put their faith in Jesus Christ and his word. That's all I'm going to say about that. We have to move on, but there is a difference. You know, there are technical terms for these and a miracle is God working outside his creation laws 
and his providence is working within those, using you and I and others. In fact, if you go out and you pray for a, a parking spot at a grocery store and one comes open, you go, oh, what a miracle. No, that's providence. You know, God, God opened up a spot for you, you know, and so we, you can call it a miracle if you want, but that's, that would fall under his providence. Uh, Jesus cleanses the man with leprosy, Matthew 8, 1 through to 4, Mark 1, 40 through to 45, and Luke 5, 12 through to 14, if you want to know where they're found. And when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I love this miracle Jesus, uh, of Jesus because Jesus reaches out and touches the unclean and makes him clean. No one wanted to touch the leper. It was forbidden. Jesus could have spoken, and at his word, the leper would have been clean. Yet he reached out and he touched the leper and he healed him. That speaks to me of love and compassion. I share the miracles of Jesus with you today so that you will have faith to believe that he still does miracles in this world to this very day. And he uses us as his body to heal the sick. We prayed for Chris this morning. I expect that Chris's ears were touched this morning and the tinnitus is gone. I pray that way, believing. John 14, 12, most assuredly I say to you, I love that, most assuredly. There's an emphasis on this. I say to you, he who believes in me, do you believe in Jesus Christ this morning? Amen. The works that I do, he will do also. Do you know that the works that Jesus done are for you to do also? That's what his word says. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Isn't that incredible? Don't think it all stopped when the apostles passed away. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. Some are apostles still. Planting churches, doing the things that apostles do. And the works continue. And greater works than these he promised that we would do. The miracle power of God is still at work in this world. Healing is still available to those who will only believe. Isaiah 53, 5 is still true and relevant in the church, the body of Christ in which he is the head. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes. We are healed. Each and every one of us have been healed already. And every one of us can receive healing for Jesus Christ in our lives when we need it. We also see this repeated in 1 Peter 2 and 24. Peter is encouraging persecuted Jewish believers to imitate Jesus and is telling them that they have a living hope in Christ Jesus. This is why we pray for miracles. This is why we believe in the miraculous. We have a living hope. Jesus is alive. And his works continue in his body in whom he is the head. This is what makes miracles available to the world. Jesus Christ is a living hope. Therefore, all he has promised us is still available through faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ uses his body, the local church, to manifest his power to a broken world in need of healing, body, soul, and spirit. He uses us. He uses each and every one of us. That's why you need to Read God's word, know God's word, believe God's word, and act on God's word. 
If he says you can lay hands on the sick and they will recover, lay hands on the sick and believe God they will recover. Trust him. Is any sick among you? Call for the elders of the church. James 5, 13 through to 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Wow, that blows me away, that part. I don't even know how to interpret that because that's beyond my pay grade. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, but if he's committed sins, the Bible says they'll be forgiven him. That's radical. I don't know where to go with that. So I'll move on. Then it says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Your prayers avail much. When you go before God and you pray earnestly before God and you believe and you have faith in what you're praying, it avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's good. He was a man with a nature like ours, just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. There's probably enough of us praying both directions that we get normal weather. <laughs> Someone's praying for cold today. Maybe the loggers are. Hey, don't laugh. <laughs> they are. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, when we love the warm, rainy weather in January, they're going, man, we can't. It's so dangerous to drive a truck on those roads. They're so slippery. They're glare ice. They freeze at night and then they melt and they get that water on them in the day. Guys die, bringing our logs to the mill. They're praying for cold weather so they can get their timber out so they won't be getting penalties and fines and all kinds of things when you don't do finish your quota. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Isn't that neat? But he prayed earnestly, and God stopped the rain. And then he prayed earnestly, and the rains came, and the earth produced its fruit. God heard Elijah's earnest prayer, and God stopped it from raining for three and a half years. And then Elijah prayed earnestly, and it rained, and the earth produced its fruit. There is nothing impossible for those who believe and place their faith in God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Matthew 17, 19 through to 21 states, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? A man was possessed with a demon. And he said to them, Because of your little faith, or my Bible says your meager faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you know how small that is, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Those seem too lofty of words for most of us. And some people go, oh yeah, well, that's, that's easy for you to say you're God. But God is saying it to us. He's saying it to each and every one of us in City Church today. If you will have the faith, the smallest amount of faith, because it was the smallest of seeds, he said nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing. What Jesus is actually saying is if you have the smallest of faith, nothing will be impossible for you. And in James 5, 16 and 7, we are reminded of the power of the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. God always manifests his power and might when we exercise faith and pray earnestly, which results in signs and wonders following us. It always happens. That's why 
when it comes to providence, I look at that and go, these are miracles. These are signs and wonders. Maybe that's a better way to call them. Instead of saying they're miracles in a sense, they're signs and wonders, but nevertheless, they're supernatural in definition because we prayed earnestly and we believed and trusted God's word. And God acted on our behalf. Then in Matthew 8, 5 through to 13, Jesus heals the centurion's servant. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word. Isn't that amazing? Just speak. The heavens and the earth will listen. And my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And another, come, and he comes. And, my, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. He understood authority. He understood the power of that you carry when you have authority. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And he was a Gentile. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. As you have believed, let it be done for you. And that very hour, his servant was healed. This is another powerful miracle of Jesus Christ. He could have spoken to the leper and he would have been healed, just like the centurion's servant. But Jesus always responds appropriate for every situation. In reality, Jesus was stating, you get it, you understand faith and how it works. Therefore, go your way. Your servant is healed. Yet there is one thing troubling about this portion of Scripture. Not all Israel will exercise saving or healing faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know if you caught that in that portion of Scripture. Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is stating that faith is not only imperative for healing, it is also imperative for salvation. Often the miracles of Jesus reveal more about the kingdom of God than just healing. Many that will come from the east and the west. Jesus is referring to the Gentiles, just like the centurion. They will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. We will be there. We will be amongst them. We are, we are co laborers but we also are joint heirs together with Jesus Christ. We will inherit the kingdom. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 and 6. And they had no to faith to believe that he is, that he was who he said he was. <coughs> then we see in Matthew 8, 23 through to 27, even the wind and the waves obeyed Jesus Christ. I love that. And I love the song that we sing. Every time we get to that part, the wind and the waves, even the wind and the waves obey, I, I can hardly sing it. I get choked up. Tears come to my eyes. 
Now, when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful? Look around, Jesus. <laughs> the boat's filling with water, um, you know. But he said, why are you fearful? O oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? I love the way Jesus manifests the power and the will of God in every circumstance of life. It is such a comfort to know Jesus is with us when the storms of life come. And they do come. The important thing to remember is Jesus is in our boat and is willing and able to calm the storms that ensue. I, I, when I was writing that, I, I, I wrote down, and the storms that prevail but they're not prevailing, they're ensuing, but they never prevail because Jesus is with us. Once again, we see the faith of God is, so, is a critical factor in the life of believers. But he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? I have to be honest, fear seems to be the response of most every believer until they learn to live by faith. And at times, fear can grip even mature believers. That's why we need to walk in the Spirit and live by faith and follow Jesus closely. Know His Word. Write it on the table of your heart. The good news is, although the disciples were fearful and lacked faith, nevertheless, Jesus responded for their plea for help and calmed the storm. And that's comforting. Even if you are fearful and lack faith. Calling out to Jesus Christ is the appropriate thing to do. Regardless of where you are in your faith, Jesus is still the answer. Jesus sets free two demon-possessed men in Matthew 28, or 8, 28 through to 34. And when he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gazarenes, Gazarenes, yeah, close enough, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? This is interesting in that no one could pass by that way. Those men were ferocious. But what's interesting is those demons didn't even attempt to attack Jesus to try to harm him. They knew they had no authority or power to attack him. Moreover, they were afraid of Jesus and were tormented by his very presence. You think you have demon problems in your life? Take some time to start praying. Spend time in the presence of God because they are tormented in the presence of God. They'll leave you for ever. They want nothing to do with the presence of God in your life. The problem is, is most people are, are, are not possessed by demons. They're actually deceived by demons. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you are Jesus's. And so what happens is you allow yourself to entertain evil in your life. And then those thoughts take over your life. And you start seeing things manifest in your life. I don't believe you're de demonically possessed. I believe that you're oppressed of the devil. That, that you've given him place in your life and uh, he's taken advantage of you. Like Andrew Womack says, he'll eat your lunch and pop your bag. <laughs> and, and, and that happens to people. 
and, and uh, you pray for them, and, and they're, they're happy and they're fine and everything. Then a couple weeks later, they're oppressed again. They're oppressed again. Well, God's not letting demons come in and out of you like a yo-yo. You're just actually entertaining things that are, that are evil, that are wrong. And it can range, we can go down the whole sin road gamut because it's all part of it. But uh, God has set us free. We're his temple. We're his purchased possession. If I'm possessed of God, the devil can't possess me. I'm possessed of God. I'm his purchased possession. He actually redeemed me. He paid the purchase price. He ransomed me. My life is not my own. It's his. The enemy doesn't have the right to come in and take what belongs to God. And I have no right to give it away because my life is not my own. I've been bought at a price with the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. Moreover, they were afraid of Jesus and were tormented by his presence. Thus it is with those who truly walk in the Spirit and live in the presence and the power of God. That's the problem. We don't walk in the Spirit and we don't live in the presence and in the power of God. When you do, it ends all that stuff. It comes to an end. We have nothing to fear. We have authority over every demonic force in the name of Jesus Christ. Demons are truly fearful of those who live surrendered lives to God and walk in the Spirit and in the power of God and know their authority in Jesus Christ. This is what takes place as the story goes on. Now a good way off from there, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go into the herd of swine. This is interesting. People could not even pass by because these two demon-possessed men, and now they're begging Jesus to allow them to go into the herd of swine if he casts them out. They have met their match. They know Jesus has both the authority and power over them. More about that in a minute. Then he said to them, Go, and they suddenly, and when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled and went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from the region. Isn't that strange? Isn't that an unexpected twist? Oh, if only we prayed and God did these particular miracles in our church, we would fill the building. Maybe. Maybe not. In this case, they wanted him to depart. We want you to leave. We don't like that. It was scary. Here is the primary problem. Instead of these people rejoicing in what Jesus had just accomplished and setting these men free, instead they are gripped with fear and want him to leave their region. Sometimes miracles do not generate the response you may think. You think this miracle would have invoked faith and rejoicing in the community, knowing Jesus was a man of authority and power. But it never. Mark 16, 17 through to 18. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. Everyone's uncomfortable with that. We started doing it in the service. Eh, some people would probably go, I, I don't know if I want to go back there. They will speak with new tongues. Some people are really uncomfortable with that as well. That's a problem for some. They will take up serpents. Well, that would be kind of weird too. But, but it's what he's talking about is demonic powers. This, Satan is referred to the serpent. And they will drink any deadly thing and it will by no means hurt them. 
They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So God is saying supernatural ability will be given to those that believe in my name. And so we should be a church of the supernatural. I don't, I don't believe we should be weird. But when God brings circumstances to our church, we need to stand in the power and the authority that he's given us and believe his word and act on it. And if someone's uncomfortable with it, be uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable. We live in a society that wants to turn everyone into a two-year-old. We do. I can't handle that. I can't handle this. I can't handle that. Handle it or go home. Take your toys with you and go home. You know? We're, we're, you know, it's true. Yeah. Come on. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Uh, uh, my mom made me uncomfortable a lot of times. <laughs> She'd just have a look at me and I was uncomfortable. Because I knew what come next. And it wasn't comforting. <laughs> But I needed that. I needed it in my life. You don't have to be comfortable all the time. You don't have to be placated all the time. You don't have to walk on eggshells in city church. And I don't have to walk on eggshells as a pastor. You know, it's, it's important. Power and authority from God is imperative for us to understand. When Jesus sent out his disciples to preach and minister, he specifically gave them power and authority over demons. Let's read uh, Luke uh, 9 and 1 again. Then he called his disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons. The term power, authority and power are related, but they carry a unique meaning and purpose. Let's break them down. It's just like miracle and providence. They carry specific, specific meanings. These two words, uh, noting they're different and how they relate to casting out demons and setting captives free. Authority. The word authority implies legal right to perform a task. Do you know that in Jesus' name that you have a legal right to perform the tasks that God's called you to? And we outline them. Healing. Preaching the gospel. It is our legal right from heaven to preach the gospel in all the earth. God has given us the legal right to it, and the government of Canada cannot stop us. I'm, I'm telling you, they may try, but they do not have the legal right because the, the, the government of God is the supreme authority in all of the universe. In other words, the disciples were authorized to cast out demons. When Jesus commissioned them to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, he gave them the necessary authority to carry out these works. We can be confident in our authority to cast out evil spirits and resist the devil. devil. But along with authority, we must walk in power. The RCMP have been given authority, but they've been given power too. And they pack a gun to prove it. Power. While authority relates to the legal right to perform a task, power refers to the ability to perform it. So not only do we need the legal right to perform a task, we need the power of God behind us to perform it. And that's the difference with some churches and some believers individually. They believe in authority, but they don't walk in power. Many of them don't even believe in the power. And that's sad. You become a country club. In the same way, we have authority to cast out demons. But we also need power in order to set captives free. This power comes to us as we are anointed with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what makes the difference. It was the anointing of the Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus to fulfill his mission. Notice this emphasis in the opening lines of Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Is the Spirit of the Lord upon you this morning? I hope 
It is. And I believe it is. You may need to come to an understanding that you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we are to walk in the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit. And if we're led by the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Why? Because the power and the anointing of God is there to set us free. But instead, we choose to live carnally and wonder why there's no power to be liberated from our sin. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. You need power to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. It was the Holy Spirit resting upon him that gave Jesus the power to set the captives free. Though he never ceased to be God, he was also fully man and functioned in his ministry as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. He even said that he casts out demons by the Spirit of God. Jesus said that. Matthew 12 and 28. Peter described the ministry of Jesus like this. God has anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. See what I mean? If you're anointed, you won't be oppressed by the devil. The problem is, is people live carnal existence, and then they're oppressed by the devil. And then he tells them, you're possessed. And they're stupid enough to believe it. They're not possessed, they're oppressed. Because they've been living carnally and filling their vessel with sin. But if you'll walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, not only will you not be oppressed of the devil, you'll be able to set others free that are oppressed by the devil through the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. For God was with him, Acts 10 and 38. How much more do we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? How much more do we need it? So this is the difference between religion and Christianity. Christianity has fuel in its tank. It is empowered of God because it isn't about some religious philosophy. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit living and abiding in us, accomplishing what God has called us to accomplish. And to me, that's the miraculous power of God. That's the miracle power of God. Call it as you want. I'm okay with terminology. But we must, as a church, walk in the power of his might. We must live by the power of the Holy Spirit in us to accomplish. You see, God's plans for your life are too great for you not to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God's plans are too great and too important for you not to allow the Holy Spirit to manifest itself in your life, not to call upon the Holy Spirit because you will sell yourself short. You will believe the voice of this world saying, that's for someone else. You'll believe the voice of the enemy whispering in your ear. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be important enough. No, but if you listen to the voice of God and you walk in the spirit, signs and wonders will follow your life. And one day you'll realize, I've accomplished what God has intended for me to accomplish. I've walked right into my destiny in Christ, full of power and full of the Spirit of God. Anyways, I'm going to park it there today. And uh, you guys have an awesome week. God bless.